Ilham and friends, as you know, you know, it's been a year since the pandemic and we have what we call the webinar fatigue. I can imagine, you know, when we're, we listen to webinars and talk, sometimes we feel like we're out of touch. So not for Helix, because we've um, put in place some measures so that we can get to know your thoughts and gather feedback from the audience. For instance, we have the hand raise button at the bottom of your screen. So you can use that during the open forum session where you can ask your questions, give your comments. And of course, throughout the session, you can use the chat box. Yeah, and also here with us again, Wendy Wong. Hi, Wendy. And who is doing our graphic documentation of all of the discussions today? And also, Regine. Yeah, there's yeah. another way we want to hear your thoughts, maybe. And then sure. we will be having a question in Mentimeter. We are sharing the link in uh, the Menti in the chat box down below. And if you are on your mobile phone or laptop or tablet, you can participate us uh, in our poll. Yes, exactly. So I believe the link should be in the chat box now. Yeah, and you will see very soon the link in the poll in the chat box down below. So we have our first Mentimeter question. What idea, product, or service amazed you when you first saw or heard about it? We invite everyone to please go into the menti.com and the rest of the link is provided in the chat box. So Ilham, while waiting for everyone to go to Menti and answer the first question, let's talk about some of our ideas. Sure. Uh, what do you think about recently a very fast mobile delivery to this recent place? Maybe you can talk about a little bit in your place, Regine. Mobile delivery means the use of mobile phones to move the, uh, services and goods from one place to another. Yeah. I it's think so that's bad. very innovative. It's important. Um, but at the same time, you know, whenever we discuss about innovation, it's also important to look at inclusion, like how many people, especially in the far-flung areas and rural areas, have access to mobile phones and apps that cater to such services. Yeah. And also, while waiting for that, we also invite again for all participants to go to your chat box and then click the link there and then you can go to our poll today. All right. So, Regine, we have... Read some of the responses, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. I see electricity. I'm actually riding on an electric tricycle right now. We have... um a mover exhibition online here through Helix. Have you heard of the tricycle or tuk-tuk? Yes. Have? Yeah, it's very common and popular anyway. Exactly. But the e-tricycle, we, ha we have batteries that um, are chargeable. So it's anticipated to reduce carbon emissions. Exactly. And then we can also see the mobile phone. So everyone can carry out anywhere, anytime. It's a small gadget, but it's very, you know, changing the way we do every day. I can imagine mobile banking would also fit into. Yeah, into we can also phone. have, you know, a Gojek, Gojek app. So app. It is, oh, it's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like online platform where we can purchase uh, foods and also we can move right. from one places to another places using that app. And also we have Zoom that we have used today. Uh, we also wow. have a self-driving vehicle. Uh, we will be seeing mm. more or with the autopilot technology. And we also have a uh, lot of like 5G. It will be interesting how all these connect to each other. I think it's quite related to the next question actually. Like how do we instance for use electricity or like reduce carbon emissions when at the same time using um, self-driving vehicles or like the, the, um, the apps that you mentioned, the, the logistic apps that you mentioned. Because yeah. I feel like that's really the core of sustainability, like how you, you, you take into all the goals at once, right? So the next question is exactly that. Um, yeah. 
reflect on the product or idea? Is it produced, used, or consumed in a sustainable way? Yeah, all right. So we can imagine, so you have chosen your uh, way in, in previous question, and then please think and reflect on the product that you chose, and then you can think whether that is sustainable or not. So you can vote whether it is sustainable or it is not sustainable in the long run. I'm glad to see the sustainable is winning. <laughs> yeah. And the cat is really, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> and it is really, it's really good. We can uh, see the progress of the vote and the yes is increasing a lot there if 83% versus the 17%. And then, oh, it's tracing up. <laughs> I hope our speakers later on will be able to shed light on what exactly the sustainable means. Right? Exactly. Like I mentioned a while ago. Does it mean just um, being, of course, the sticking in the planet goals or how about local and people empowerment and then of course the profitability etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah i think it is now 80 79 80 79 and then we can see the result in a few minutes uh, let's wait again so i think most of the participants and our audiences today are actually choosing that those products are actually sustainable in the long run That's good. And like I said, like I think I mentioned while we were going over the um, answer to the previous question, the five C. So you have um, looking into the planet. What does sustainable mean? I'm, I hope more people will use the chat box, like I mentioned a while ago, and, and maybe later the raising hand button so you can share more of your ideas on, um, let's say, like it. Does okay. Sustainable so mean planet and etc. people, profit. Yeah, and for the third question in the poll, that what mode of transport for travel or delivery of good in your community is sustainable? So this is a typical question related it's to the a more one. concrete question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, we see that when demand and supply are met. Let's go. Uh, we invite everyone to vote. We only see one. Uh, we have small truck. We have bicycle. Of course, bicycle is winning. Bicycle twice, really exactly. Really the most sustainable Three, yeah. classic example. I think we see more bicycle there. And we Train, have so meaning public transportation. Uh, yeah, and then we have an anim sorry, animals and local for WDS. And also we have cars. We have motorbike too. It's still, you know, receiving f more polls from our participants today. I'd be interested to see more like typical ASEAN answers. Like what are the you know, modes of transportation that are sustainable within the 10 ASEAN member states? Yeah, and also my lovely bicycle there. So it is very good. Uh, if we, if you know that most of the, you know, company. Are you the one who wrote that, Ilham? My lovely no. bicycle. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I love my bicycle, but uh, this is actually coming from the participants. And we have Becha there. So Becha is like, uh, we have also with. Uh, What's Becha actually? Becha is like tuk-tuk uh, and is very oh, okay. common in Indonesian word. I see Tuk Tuk just now. Yeah, we have a tricycle like that. And then we have also light rail transit or subway. Uh, we also have electric vehicle. So it's very, you know, very sustainable and uh, we can recharge it. Uh, traditional truck. So do you have a traditional truck, uh, Regin? What do you mean by traditional truck? Meaning, uh, the, the truck is traditional, maybe. Right. <laughs> yeah. Fit, yeah. The and then uh, we can uh, see again, I think most of the time is a bicycle, truck, and also, uh, yeah, electric one. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much to everyone. We who can participated see again, I think most of the time is a bicycle, truck, and also, uh, 
Okay, Elham. So yeah. I think that right. ends our poll. We had three questions. Thank you again to those who participated. Shall we proceed oh. to the meat of our program? Yeah, so we asked this question in Menti region because we are going to have and we talk about the green logistic. We have a very experienced speaker to enlighten us on the topic today. So our first speaker is the Director for Operations Development and Go Green at the DHL Supply Chains. So Ms. Amrita Khadilhar, as part of the her portfolio, she manages DHL supply chain sustainability strategy and targets for the Asia Pacific region. So her work involves implementing organizations what change initiatives and leveraging on technological innovation to further DHL's green agenda. So prior to joining DHL in 2015, Amrita had over 10 years of experience in management positions across Asia Pacific in area of supply chain management, project delivery, and also, of course, the procurement. She holds a Bachelor of Business Administration, which is the honored one from NUS, and an MBA from INSAT. She also holds a PMP and LIN Practitioner credentials. So, DHL Director for Operations Development and Go Green from Singapore, Ms. Amrita Khadilhar, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Ilham. And um, good morning to everyone. Um, hope you can hear me okay. Can you just confirm that you can? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay, great. Okay, so let me um, share my screen because I do have some slides that I would like to um, share. Just give me a moment. Okay, so again, very good morning to all of you and thank you um, for the opportunity. Thank you to the AHA Center for the opportunity to present to you this morning on a, a very interesting topic and a very relevant topic for our times, which is green logistics. Um, and really I'm coming from the perspective of commercial logistics sector, um, looking at how logistics and supply chains are being transformed through an emphasis on sustainability. So um, I, I won't go through this too much, but um, I work for DHL supply chain in Asia Pacific based in Singapore. Um, and my role really within the organization is to work with different parts of our operations um, to put in place um, sustainable technologies, processes and practices. In this presentation today, um, I've um, highlighted four key topics for discussion. Um, firstly, I will start off by looking at green logistics from a DHL perspective, um, really looking at our focus areas in terms of um, where we see the importance of green logistics, um, why we are looking into it, what are our longer term strategies and so on. Um, we will go on to talk about more specific um, technologies, products, and solutions that we are using today in our operations that promote sustainability. Um, I'll briefly touch on um, a macro view of ASEAN and some of the opportunities that I see um, for green logistics in this region. Um, and last but not least, a very brief intro to applications um, of some of these solutions within the humanitarian logistics sector. So let's start off by looking at green logistics from a DHL perspective. Okay, so the transportation and logistics sector, um, not surprisingly, is responsible for a uh, quite a heavy percentage of global greenhouse gas emissions, over 16%. And within that, DHL's share is quite sizable. Um, so DHL is a group, the DPDHL group, we operate in 220 countries worldwide. Um, we employ more than um, half a million people. So just by that sheer global scale of our operations, our share of the total sector emissions is also significant. 
Um, these are the reasons why we believe at DPDHL very strongly that the transportation sector in general and DPDHL group in particular have a key responsibility in terms of trying to minimize the carbon emissions that we generate due to our operations um, and minimize our impact on the sustainable health of our planet. Um, and the sustainability conversation is not just becoming important um, for within DHL. Um, what we see globally is that several groups of stakeholders are equally interested in the concept of sustainability and what it means for them. For instance, some of our largest customers are setting themselves very ambitious sustainability targets. What we are also seeing is the end customer is becoming much more um, conscious of their environmental footprint and they are making buying decisions or purchasing decisions on the basis of that. We are also seeing in increasingly government policies that are promoting sustainability. And we are seeing an inflow of investment into the development of sustainable green technologies for the industrial sector. So all in all, this is a topic that is a topic for our times and it is here to stay um, in a big way. Now with that in mind, um, the DPDHL group this year, earlier this year, we launched a new sustainability roadmap. Um, and sustainability for us, I heard a question earlier on uh, when um, the introduce, introductions were being made that what is sustainability? And sustainability for us in DHL um, comprises of not just environmental sustainability, but also the social and governance aspects of it. Um, however, for today's presentation, um, I will be concentrating on the environmental sustainability strategy of DHL, um, again, due to the focus on green logistics um, in this particular session. So this is the longer term vision for DHL, what we call Mission 2050. That is our ambition to be a, zero, a net zero emissions company by the year 2050. And we are very proud to say that we were one of the first logistics companies in the world to outline such an ambitious target for ourselves. And really, we are continuing to set new standards that help us to protect the environment, fight climate change, and achieve this zero emissions goal. Now, this slide outlines for you some of the um, sustainability commitments that we have made as part of our recent sustainability roadmap. At a group level, um, we have committed that we will reduce our CO2E emissions to below 29 million tons by the year 2030. And this is in line with science-based targets, which I'll explain in just a bit. We have also committed as a group that we will invest 7 billion euros by the year 2030 in various clean and green technologies. Now, what are science-based targets? So these are basically absolute carbon emission reduction targets that help us to contribute to the global goal of limiting temperature increases to less than 10, sorry, less than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Companies that sign on to science-based targets are given carbon emission budgets, which they are not expected to exceed. And for DHL, this is our carbon emissions budget, which is 29 million tons of CO2e. On this slide, you will also see a number of initiatives that we will be using to help us achieve these targets. And we will look at some of these in more detail in the upcoming slides. So with that, let's go um, and look at in a bit more detail, what are some of these green logistics, technologies, products, and solutions that we use in a commercial context on a day-to-day -day basis? But before I do that, um, let me just clarify that the DPDHL group comprises of various different business units. 
We've got our freight forwarding business, um, which looks at um, you know forwarding across borders. So a lot of sea transport, a lot of air transport. We have our express and parcel delivery services, which again look at air transport as well as a lot of last mile deliveries. And then we have our contract logistics part of our business, which is DHL supply chain um, that looks at both warehousing as well as transport fulfillment activities for primarily for business to business customers. And this is the business unit that I belong to. DHL supply chain. So a lot of the examples that I will be talking about relate to contract logistics as a sector. Let's start off by understanding what do we mean by carbon footprint? So from a contract logistics um, standpoint, we run large warehouses and fulfillment centers for our customers. We use a lot of electricity in running these centers. We use a lot of water. We deal with a lot of packaging waste, which needs to be disposed. And in colder climate countries, we are also using fuel to heat up these warehouses. So all of this, of course, creates a carbon footprint. For transport as well, we are using a lot of fossil fuels to transport um, goods from point A to point B. Again, an activity which is very carbon intensive. Now, when we start talking to our customers about green logistics and how we can make their supply chains greener, what we do is we talk to them about three types of solutions, green transport, green warehousing, as well as optimized and sustainable packaging solutions. Now, under our newly announced environmental strategy, we have made a number of commitments, especially in the transport sector. So for transport, we have committed that we will electrify 60% of our last mile delivery vehicles by 2030. And we will grow the share of sustainable biofuels in our line haul transport to greater than 30% by 2030. Um, we have also committed that we will continue to drive continuous improvement activities like driver training, creating green products for our customers, um, as well as looking into transport optimization. What is transport optimization? Now, transport optimization refers to um, a set of activities and technologies that really help us to reduce the number of kilometers traveled um, by way of better transport planning or better route planning. It also helps us to reduce empty running, so which is transportation without any cargo, um, by looking at backhaul legs, by looking at reverse logistics opportunities and so on. Transport optimization is also a way for us to increase the utilization of our vehicles so that we are transporting the maximum amount of cargo in the minimum number of transport movements. All of these together, reduce the fuel consumption of our vehicles and thereby they reduce carbon emissions. We also look at what we call low hanging fruit in terms of our driver training programs. So at DHL, we spend a lot of effort annually to train our drivers to drive in a fuel efficient manner. So really using very basic sustainable practices such as no sudden braking or no sudden acceleration, um, you know, using cruise control, no idling. All of these are very simple practices that help us to make a big difference in terms of the amount of fuel that our drivers are using, especially in last mile delivery in urban areas. Now this slide um, shows you a summarized view of some of the green transport logistic solutions that we use um, on a day-to-day -day uh, basis in different parts of our business. So we have some standard solutions. So um, as a standard, we use telematics or transport management services or systems um, to really drive that transport optimization. We used aerodynamically enhanced trailers, which consume less fuel. And we also use some innovative technologies such as flexible solar panels that can be fitted on the roofs of our vehicles um, and they help to reduce the fuel consumption of our vehicles that is needed to power up air conditioning. 
In terms of more advanced solutions, which require more investment or more time and effort, um, we look at vehicles that use alternative drives and alternative fuels. So a lot of uh, vehicles that use uh, biofuels, bio LNG, bio CNG comprise um, this advanced solution category, and so do electric vehicles. So that's just a summarized view of our green transport solutions that we use in our commercial fleets. Let's turn our focus to warehousing. So as part of our um, recently announced sustainability roadmap, the concept of carbon neutral buildings is becoming highly relevant and prevalent. Also, we are looking at a transition um, from using non-renewable sources of energy to using more renewable sources of energy, for instance, solar energy. We are also now recognizing increasingly that digital energy management solutions are the way for the future. They are the solutions that will help us um, to minimize the carbon footprint of running large facilities. Now, this is again a similar summarized view in terms of warehousing. So our DHL standard solutions in the area of warehousing include um, you know, energy efficient and motion sensor controlled LED lighting. They include intelligent high frequency charging for our material handling equipment. And they include things like a waste management practices, recycling, waste balers, and so on. From the perspective of more advanced solutions that require more investment and I suppose longer um, sort of payback periods, we are looking at things like putting in place solar panels on the roof of our warehouses, looking at thermal reflective roof coating um, that helps to deflect sunlight and reduce air conditioning expense, again, on the roofs of our warehouses, and using biogas instead of fossil fuels to heat up warehouses where we need to. Packaging is a very key area for a contract logistics company. And we often talk to our customers about three different aspects of packaging, equipment, materials, and process. Um, now, some of the common examples of sustainable packaging solutions that we use in our warehouses, in our operations, are um, equipment such as automated pallet wrappers, um, carton box sizes, which um, you know, help us to create customized cartons based on the product that we are transporting. We are looking at recyclable biodegradable materials for our stretch wraps, for our void fillers. And of course, we are looking at improvement processes in relation to waste recycling, zero waste to landfill, as well as waste failing. So these are some common examples of solutions that we use day to day in our operations to make our operations more sustainable. Um, now, as we um, briefly touched on before, um, around the world, um, there are several um, key um, discussion points that are coming up. So there is um, an increasing awareness of urban pollution and increasing awareness of the need to move away from polluting technologies. There are growing customer demands um, to look at environmental sustainability. And all of these factors are affecting not just a private company like DHL, but they are also impacting government and non government bodies alike. So let's take a bit of a macro view and look at ASEAN as a region and, and see what some of the aspects of sustainable logistics in ASEAN are. Now, ASEAN is a very important region for the world. It is the world's fifth largest economy. The demand for transport in ASEAN is set to increase by 60% from 2013 to 2040. Energy demand in ASEAN is also set to grow by a similar amount, around 70% between 2020 and 2040. But interestingly, renewable energy currently meets only about 15% of the region's energy demand. 
Now, what we have seen in recent years is that many countries in ASEAN have developed their own objectives and targets relating to sustainability, um, be it in terms of energy self-sufficiency or emission reductions, public transportation models, and so on. Um, let's take example of the renewable energy sector. Now, ASEAN as a region has a lot of natural potential for renewable energy production, especially solar energy because of its geographic position on the equator. So with that in mind, ASEAN as a group um, has set itself an ambitious target of meeting 23% of primary energy supply from renewable sources by the year 2025. So taking a cue from that, several governments in ASEAN are also looking quite keenly at the renewable energy sector. They're looking at growing that sector um, within their economies. Singapore, for instance, has just announced a green plan 2030 and solar energy production is an important part of this plan. Um, the ambition is to increase the solar PV energy production by almost five folds by the year 2030. Vietnam has put in place um, several taxation and investment policies that um, have helped to increase the solar PV energy production from 86 megawatts in 2018 to over 4,700 megawatts in 2019. Similar trends and similar emphasis can be seen in other countries, um, for instance, in Malaysia as well. So all in all, we can see that a lot is being done at a government level to promote this industry, to grow the capability of these economies to handle a more sustainable future. But as with everything, you know, there are some areas of improvement. There are some areas which do require more focus ongoing. Um, one of such areas relates to the consistency and harmonization of initiatives and standards. So currently in ASEAN, different countries have um, quite different fuel efficiency standards. They have different ways in which they are using and producing biofuels, et cetera. What is probably required is a better harmonization of these standards. And what harmonization will do is it will help us to build capacity more efficiently, um, it will help us to um, uh, share R&D more effectively, reduce costs overall, and really increase the ease of cross-border trade and investment. The second area where probably more emphasis needs to be given from all um, angles, whether public or private, is in the area of innovation. So more the area of innovation is very broad and several different types of innovation are needed to grow this industry. Maybe I'll just name um, only three of these. The first area of innovation is in um, energy storage. Uh, or batteries that help us to store energy produced due to renewable sources. And effective cost um, viable um, sources of energy storage are required to be developed so that um, it will help us to tackle the risk of variable supply. That is a common risk in terms of renewable energy production. It will also help to share or transport renewable electricity or renewable energy to remote parts of the region. And this is actually specifically important from the context of humanitarian logistics. More innovation is also required, continuing innovation in the area of biofuels. How do we generate biofuels, develop biofuels in a more sustainable manner? And how do we um, develop them in a more cost-effective manner Then that can be then used by the commercial logistics sector? And last but not least, there is an area whereby um, more innovation is needed in the production of um, renewable energy technologies, um, for instance, solar panels, more locally in the region, so that we can reduce the cost of transporting this equipment and these technologies from other parts of the world, and thereby make it even more cost competitive. So these are just some of um, ideas and thoughts around how um, you know, the sustainability sector and this region Region can be further enhanced. Let's look at the last section, which is applications for humanitarian logistics. Now, this is an area where you will no doubt hear 
much more detail in today's session or, or uh, the remaining sessions for the day today. So I won't go into too much detail here. Um, I just wanted to share my perspective that a lot of the solutions that I have spoken about that are used day to day in a commercial logistics context can be applied to a humanitarian logistics um, sector as well. So for instance, take an example of transport. Now, basic transport sustainable practices such as driver training, transport planning to improve vehicle utilization, regular maintenance to maintain vehicle fuel efficiencies, as well as disposal of transport waste sustainably. These are all practices that can be translated to the humanitarian logistics sector. And they not only um, help us to sort of reduce the carbon footprint, they also help to reduce the cost of operating and maintaining these fleets. Next, look at um, warehousing and facilities management. Um, solar panels and rainwater harvesting systems could be installed in warehouses and facilities to, to provide the needed water and power to run these facilities, um, thereby reducing reliance on traditional generators that consume a lot of um, fossil fuels. Now, this is especially relevant because in a number of regions or areas where humanitarian aid operations are required, um, the availability of fuel or um, the electricity infrastructure may not be robust or may be quite volatile. And last but not least, use of sustainable packaging solutions can also be very relevant for humanitarian logistics because it can help minimize the carbon footprint of these activities. So some of the applicable sustainable packaging technologies can be biodegradable or natural material packaging and uh, void fill packaging, which uses less material like pre-stretched wrap or cardboard boxes that are more appropriately sized and so on. So the examples are many, but I just wanted to provide a bit of a flavor of what could be um, translated from one sector to the other. And that's really um, all I had for today's um, initial presentation. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to present to you, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, Regin, thank you so much. Uh, yes. And then we can move to another uh, speakers today. So can you introduce exactly. to us our second uh, speakers? So our for the question speaker. and answer, maybe we can uh, put it later after the second uh, speakers. So the next speaker will actually give us the humanitarian perspective of green logistics and the talk will begin with a global perspective and drill down to the operational aspects of implementing green logistics. We have with us the operational um, aspects will be tackled by Mr. Giles Menoit Favier, experienced logistics and supply chain manager with qualification and a strong interest in renewable energy. Uh, yes, good morning, all. Uh, greetings from Kabul. Uh, can someone assist me because I'm not able to share my screen. Someone else seems to share his own. So it would be great if uh, you can help on this. Yes, sure. So we can uh, help you assisting that. So please check whether you can see something on your screen. Yeah. 
So um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Yes, good morning, oh, everyone. Um, let me start so, by saying that um, sorry for the, the, the sound, but I'm in Kabul so far. And connection uh, connectivity is not always the best. So sorry if uh, the sound is not good. Uh, my presentation was supposed to follow the one from Carmen Garcia, who is the uh, uh, responsible for the sustainability uh, supply chain alliance within ICRC and the Red Cross and uh, Red Crescent movement. But unfortunately, she has not able. To she was not able to attend this meeting so far, so let's hope she will be able to join a bit later. Uh, she asked me actually to give um, a field perspective of how sustainability can be integrated in the humanitarian supply chain and the humanitarian uh, operation. So, um, just for you to know, I've been uh, working with ICLC over the five past years. Uh, before that, I was uh, doc working with doctors without, without borders uh, in several emergencies, including uh, the um, emergencies uh, responding to the um, typhoon in Philippines in 2014. And uh, as I uh, was mentioned by uh, Rosin, uh, I have quite a lot of interest in sustainability. Uh, and so uh, it's in this view that I uh, will give you my presentation of today. Um, at first, sustainability can seem a bit contradictory to uh, humanitarian response and humanitarian supply chain because of the context we are working in. And um, usually the context we are working in are characterized by the volatility and uncertainty. And so uh, most of the time, the humanitarian actors uh, don't, really, um, don't really integrate the sustainability uh, criteria into the action. So um, this has created uh, over the years and over the emergency in a humanitarian organization, a mechanism and reflex that not always cope with uh, a sustainable approach. And so I think it's really important to take into consideration the uh, might change management within humanitarian actors when we speak about sustainability in the supply chain. In addition, uh, last year I've seen one of the biggest uh, pandemic uh, over the past 100 years. And it has brought uh, a lot of financial uncertainty for humanitarian organization, since we are relying uh, more and more on donors. And um, it's, um, it's quite complicated to integrate uh, the sustainability criteria, especially when it's seen as an expensive and time consuming uh, criteria to integrate into our action. So um, for me, in, in my perspective, um, it's how can we change the mind of our colleagues, resident and mobile staff uh, by integrating a concept that is not always seen as uh, the most cost effective uh, without impacting our operation and uh, at the end to create an added value for humanitarian logistics. Um, I will speak about a case study that I had the chance to implement in 2019 with the ICRC in Central Africa, which is the creation of uh, the Douala Logistic Hub. Douala is one of the main ports of the Central African region, um, which uh, basically uh, is the main entrance for all supply chain within Central Africa. 
So um, ICRC has decided in 2019, January 2019, to open a logistic hub in order to support our operation in Central African Republic, in Chad and in Cameroon. Um, operation that were initially supported by our logistic center in Abidjan. That's the picture on the left. Um, we have decided while uh, opening this um, this logistic hub actually to integrate the sustainability criteria from the beginning, knowing that uh, we did begin this uh, project without any infrastructure, so we had to begin from scratch. And um, the idea of this logistic hub was only to concentrate on a supply chain department that includes uh, order management, uh, warehousing operation, uh, transport and custom clearance, and uh, procurement uh, on site. So I will not come back uh, to all the development we have done there, but in 18 months, it was possible for us to review all the supply chain strategy that include inter, uh, the use of inter and multimodal transport, including rails in the region. Um, we have launched um, a new pilot project that is the ISO certification 40001 uh, related to environmental management, mostly for welding operation. And that is a first for humanitarian organization. We create a project called Douala Green Logistics that has the focus to uh, tackle the waste uh, and water management within our operation in Douala. And we did manage at the end to, um, uh, to open as well a new supply chain corridor to the port of Quibi, which had direct connection uh, uh, from China and from Europe. And instead of doing cabotage all alongside the West African ports, uh, we could have direct transport directly to Cameroon in order to supply our operation in the region. So now coming back to Afghanistan, I begin my mission in Afghanistan last August 2020. And um, when I arrived, I had all the dual findings in mind. And uh, the first thing I organized with the team was a brainstorming uh, with them uh, in order to see how we can integrate the um, sustainability criteria into our operation without having impact into our operation. You might have heard over the past few months that the uh, situation in Afghanistan is getting worse and worse, especially in terms of security management. Uh, access road inside the country are an extremely complex challenge since there are fights a bit everywhere. So uh, the volatility of the context has a direct impact in uh, our operation. But how can we integrate the sustainability criteria into our supply chain? So the first, um, the first step we decide to tackle was to review our supply chain strategy. Historically, uh, Afghanistan has been supplied through the Karachi port and uh, Peshawar uh, logistic center we have uh, in Pakistan. And that has been the case over the past 30 years for historical reason and uh, uh, for practical reason. But the pandemic last year has shown us that the border closure and systematic border closure between Afghanistan and Pakistan has a direct impact on the supply chain. So we have decided to explore, uh, instead of having a centralized supply chain strategy to only one uh, supply chain corridor, to check the opportunity to have a decentralized supply chain and mostly by exploring the possibility to the north and uh, to, to benefit actually from the Belt Road Initiative from uh, uh, Chinese authorities that allows us to uh, bring stuff into Afghanistan by the north supply chain corridor. 
uh, including by train. So the train is not reaching uh, Mazar e Sharif in the north of Afghanistan. And we thought that it was a good opportunity for us to implement that uh, for supply chain strategy. So um, I will focus now on practical measures we have taken. Uh, we have taken in order uh, to integrate sustainability, knowing that not all of them are the best one. Uh, we still need to do a lot of change mind management with the staff because uh, you have to know that while working in a complex security humanitarian um, context, uh, usually our colleague from the country uh, the job is the only thing that is a bit reliable in the life, and so uh, they don't like change, so change management is something essential, and this takes a long time to implement. That say, over the past eight months, we have tried to um, uh, integrate the waste management, that is uh, the waste management produced by our logistic center and by our workshop uh, facilities in Afghanistan by involving first the staff. So we have focal point on almost every site uh, we are dealing with in Afghanistan. We are organizing now month monthly training and awareness session in order to explain the people the importance to have um, a waste and water management within our facilities. Uh, we have identified um, contractors that um, so recycling contractors on which we can rely to ensure a proper recycling of our seg segregated uh, waste. And basically, uh, I'm trying to, um, to implement this sustainability within the mind of my staff by learning by doing. In terms of other management, as I was mentioning, we have reviewed our supply chain strategy. Uh, the review of the supply chain strategy is, of course, to see what is possible to do outside Afghanistan in terms of transport, pro procurement, etc. But it is as well essential to identify and to see if um, we can rely on local supplier that will uh, shorten uh, our supply chain uh, lead time and length. So uh, we are on the process now to do um, supplier mapping of all what is available in Afghanistan. Uh, but I will go back to that for more the procurement side. And we are now in a position to say what we want to source from where in order to reduce our uh, carbon footprint uh, for the operation in Afghanistan. In terms of transport, we are trying to use uh, more and more the railway option. So for the moment, we have uh, our team in Benjin that are organizing um, a transport for him, from us. is is in the testing phase so far, but we have a shipment that has reached Umrum Urumqi and that should arrive by train into Afghanistan over the next few weeks. So multimodality of transport is something that we are trying to uh, improve a lot. Uh, of course, we need to always make balance between the sea road train and air option according to the uh, operation, uh, operation needs. Um, we have to balance as well the, the insourcing or outsourcing of the transport. So we have designed now, and don't worry, the trucks that you can see below uh, on the picture below are the trucks we were using 20 years ago. Now we have uh, our own fleet of uh, ICRC trucks inside Afghanistan. And we did manage over the past two months to organize several field trips to our uh, offices. Um, so this is as well a balance we need to uh, find. And we need to try while outsourcing our transport to uh, work with partners that are respecting international norm and regulation regarding uh, the carbon emissions. In terms of procurement, I was mentioning that uh, you have to make always balance between local, uh, pardon, 
the balance between the local and international slash regional procurement. So we have been um, for the past five months uh, a general assessment of um, supplier facilities within Afghanistan. Uh, we have a quality of quality manager for ICRC that will come to visit us in July in order to uh, check if the uh, supplier we can use in Afghanistan and for which we have an interest in terms of uh, procurement uh, are respecting uh, international standards in terms of sustainability. Of course, uh, we will not find someone uh, coping with 100% of uh, this criteria, but the idea is to, to accompany them uh, in order for them to improve uh, the QHSC and, uh, and the sustainability. And so this is as well part of our job to try to uh, accompany uh, local supplier in order uh, to have a side effect on our operation. In terms of warehousing management, well, it's just some examples, but for example, uh, over the uh, past 20 years, we have been using propylene bags to kit uh, or humanitarian assistance. We are now in the process uh, to adapt our kits with uh, carbon, uh, carton box uh, that are locally sourced, as mentioned by uh, my colleague from DHL just before. So that's, that's just practical solution we have now. Um, we will have soon to uh, move our logistics center and we are trying as well to explore all the sustainability solutions such as energy storage, um, energy storage, uh, energy performance building, et cetera, for our next logistics center in order to integrate the uh, new solution. Waste management, of course, is one of the uh, most important uh, tasks for us since we are consuming a lot of items, a lot of packaging, etc. So, or to reduce our waste uh, in order to uh, reach sustainability criteria. And last but not least, we are about we are to um, we are about to integrate QHSC standards in our warehousing operation uh, during the second semester. Uh, since it is something that is completely inexistent in uh, Kabul. And so uh, we are planning a uh, proper training of our staff in order to implement that in our warehousing operation. So um, it's a short presentation, but uh, you will have the occasion to ask all the questions you want. But as a conclusion, is that sustainability is not an, an option anymore since most of the donors is a requirement for most of the donors now. Uh, by experience, I can say that small action can have big impact. Uh, that means by changing small things, you can have a huge impact on the sustainability of your supply chain. Creativity is a must. Uh, you need to uh, always think uh, far ahead and uh, to, to be creative if you want to integrate uh this criteria and um as final conclusion i will say in my mind and in my view sustainability and humanitarian supply chain are not on that contract directory but they are complementary and i thank you for your attention okay uh thank you uh, mr Benoit. So we invite everyone again to go down there. If you can see in the screen, the question and answer tab. So you can click there and then you can ask as many as questions you can to our speakers today. But before that, so it is a very good speech. And also, uh, when we talk about situation in Afghanistan, which may seem far, from many of us in ASEAN, but it's very good example of the most difficult transport and the logistic context that, that can push us to do more sustainable uh, strategies. So it's very good. So while waiting, uh, Regin, we have uh, several uh, questions coming in, and then we would like to uh, put that in our session now. So there is uh, one question, the first question, I mean, uh, coming, 
from land and also it is addressed or it is asked to our uh, speaker from DHL. So are they already innovation to replace the styrofoams for packing equipments or shipping? Miss Amrita? Okay, so um, yeah, so we are looking at various alternatives to replace um, styrofoams and plastic void fill, as we call it, um, in uh, packaging. So there are a couple of different types. Um, we use paper-based void fillers um, that are made from recyclable cardboard or recyclable paper. Um, there are also uh, another category, which is um, bio-based fill, as we call it. Um, and these are made out of, um, you know, um, compostable or biodegradable wow. material um, and biological or natural materials such as, um, you know, sugarcane or uh, maize starch and things like that. So um, we are looking at various different ways of reducing the plastic void fill. Um, I also mentioned before that we look at a technology called the carton box size which helps us to um, create the optimal size of a package or a carton so that we avoid the use of um, a lot of void fill. So that's another way in which we uh, minimize the usage of void fill. Yeah. Okay, so we have also the next question, Regine, please. Yes, you know, Ilham, I was just about to say that actually one of the things that I really appreciate about this talk is seeing the involvement of the private sector. Because as you know, like if we have different stakeholders, public sector, private sector, youth, women, all the sectors involved, that can really achieve sustainability. So, Ms. Amrita, our next question is, how far has DHL used green logistics for supporting humanitarian action, for, for being part of this humanitarian movement here in ASEAN and also beyond? Um, look, I think green logistics is um, is a growing area of focus for us, and DHL um, does have um, what we call our Go Help program, um, by way of which we work with humanitarian organizations around the world um, uh, to um, you know assist with our expertise in humanitarian aid missions. We have a Get Airports Ready for Disaster program, as well as disaster response teams that are working. Um, very closely with um, aid agencies. Um, we are using uh, our logistics expertise when we um, work with aid agencies to carry out um, these um, activities. So we are using things like our transport planning expertise to ensure that you know, we are uh, maximizing the utilization of our vehicles or we are delivering um, the supplies in the most sort of efficient manner. So we are bringing in a lot of these systems and that system and process knowledge first and foremost to um, um, uh, you know, transfer what we have commercial in commercial logistics, all the business practices to a humanitarian context. We are also continuing to look at, um, you know, innovative forms of packaging that um, will help us to deliver aid um, in the most efficient manner while reducing the cost of transportation of these packages. So currently we use um, these uh, uh, packaging bags called speed balls, which um, uh, you know pro uh, give us an efficient way of um, air dropping um, supplies over remote areas, for instance. And and again, you know, we are not at that stage where we uh, where I can say that um, we have eliminated plastic packaging to a, a one hundred percent, but we are continuing our work uh, in terms of um, you know working towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for, for all the work that you do. Ilham, can we entertain a few more questions or? Yeah, we also have, uh, sure. We also have a, a, a more questions. So what kind of sustainable fuel that the HL is exploring? Okay, so we are doing a lot of research in the area of sustainable fuels. So at the moment, uh, we are uh, primarily looking at um, biofuel, um, including biodiesel. We are also doing for our aviation, we are doing a lot of research um, in the field of um, biokerosene. Um, again, um, the uh, biofuel is an interesting topic because um, 
if the biofuel really has to be sustainable, it has to be produced in a sustainable way. So we are, um, again, as, as I mentioned, I think more innovation is needed um, to help do that for biofuel. So um, these are some of the areas that we are looking at. We're also looking at um, electric vehicles, as I mentioned, so really going off the topic of biofuels completely, but within biofuels, yes, we are looking at some of these fuels that I just mentioned. Okay, thank you. So we have more questions to come. Uh, Regine? Yes, um, we have a comment that, that wants to say congratulations for the, the 2030 roadmap and considerable, considerable pledge to sustainable logistics. The questions are, how has this roadmap been received by existing partners, government and non-government? Did it encourage new partnerships? Um, so, look, I, I think this roadmap, um, I would say that has been very well received in general, as you can expect, um, because a lot of the aims that we are, um, you know, uh, committing to under this roadmap are um, in line with the UN sustainability goals. They are in line with the various emission targets and sustainability strategies that um, country governments have put in place for their various economies. So a lot of the work we are doing is is very much aligned to that. So from that macro public sector perspective, yes, it has been very well received. Um, also, quite importantly for us as a commercial entity, a lot of our customers are really keen that they partner with logistics providers that are uh, big on green logistics. So some of our largest customers are setting their own sustainability targets and they are requiring us, they are coming to us and asking us to work with them to make sure that um, for instance, a, a large FMCG customer came to us recently and said, I want to eliminate all single use plastics from my warehouses. How can DHL help me to do that? So these are just some examples of, um, you know, feedback that we are getting from our different stakeholders. So all in all, I think um, it has been a very timely and uh, effective initiative. Yeah. Thank you. We just received another question for Mr. Dealey. In greening its humanitarian logistics, who is Red Cross ITRC working with? Can you come again, please? Who, who is ICRC working with when it comes to greening logistics? So, uh, actually, I'm not in a position to answer this question. This should have and um, again, me, I'm on the field perspective, but uh, I can give you, for example, the example of Douala. Um, we have decided to uh, also uh, warehousing operation. And so uh, actually when we launched the tender, um, it was mandatory for the potential supplier to respect a uh, minimum international standard regarding uh, ISO certification. QHSC implementation, etc. So actually, uh, we are trying to work as much as we can and depending what we can find in the field uh, with uh, partners that are local or international that uh, uh, certify uh, for certain criteria according to uh, the, um, the supply chain department we, we want to work with. I don't know if it answered the question, but... Uh, it really depends on a case by case. Uh, it's on a case by case basis, and uh, it really depends on uh, what we can find into the field. Okay, wonderful. I think Elhan, like I said, it's really good to hear from experiences of both um, both kinds of entities. You know, pri private sector and then a humanitarian organization. Yeah, exactly. Are we still able to entertain a few questions? Yeah, or does that mark the end of the session? Uh, I think we have uh, more questions, especially for Ms. Amrita. For a driving or driver training, would you have a module or program that you can share? 
Okay, so the driver training is a pretty, um, I would say, decentralized activity because a lot, um, it is customized to each country based on local language and also local regulations. Um, we do have some um, general principles of driver training that I mentioned during my presentation. And later on, I'll be happy to share more details of that. Um, but again, those general principles are then put into practice um, in a decentralized way in each country. So we don't have one module that just goes out to every country. It is really worked on by every operation based on their requirements. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think to wrap up, uh, this is the questions for both Ms. Amrita and also Mr. Benoit. What is the humanitarian corridor and how does it improve humanitarian logistic? So again, I can't, this, um, um, sorry. So again, this is so something that uh, you have to take uh, case by case. Uh, sometimes you have uh, officials and authorities that allow some uh, supply chain corridors for humanitarian actions. Uh, this is uh, mainly uh, imposed by government while you have a uh, quite important crisis. While you are working at country level like me, you have to open your own corridors uh, according to rules and regulations uh, that you, you can find on the spot. So uh, actually, for example, in the case of Afghanistan, as I mentioned, uh, the supply chain corridor has traditionally been through uh, Pakistan via the port of Karachi. But uh, actually, we have noticed that uh, the North supply chain corridors going through Mazar and Sharif is now a reality, and we can use it on a more efficient way, knowing that we are reducing our leading time. We are able to integrate the sustainability criteria by using the rail, etc. So it's really on a case by case, uh, uh, region by region, country by country, and it really depends on the uh, context and the reality in the field. Yeah, I think um, I would just like to echo that as well. I think humanitarian corridors, of course, are very important in terms of ensuring um, the seamless sort of passage of goods and services. Um, and again, from um, the company's perspective, I suppose from a company like DHL, um, we are working hand in hand with several governments and several sort of um, local authorities to um, really put in place some strategies that will, um, you know, make it more efficient to help that movement along. So uh, I mentioned our um, get airports ready for disaster program, for instance, is, is a good example of that. So, um, yeah, so nothing more to add, but just want to support what the earlier speaker said. Yeah. Okay, so the last question that I would like to raise is coming from our participant too. So how do you see the DHL and ICRC work with ASEAN, in particular with the ASEAN Center, in promoting green logistics? Um, yeah, look, from our perspective, again, um, a lot would also um, be through our Go Health program, which is our, um, you know, social responsibility and community engagement program, whereby we work with organizations such as the AHA Center to, um, like I mentioned, you know, share our best practices, share our learnings, and maybe some of our technologies and processes to um, help uh, bring that um, commercial logistics perspective into the running of warehousing or road transport, if you will. So um, that's our primary way to work with organizations such as yourselves to uh, make this better. And, and through, through engagement forums like this, you know, whereby we get a chance to share what we are doing and, and to understand from the participants what are some of the areas of concerns that we can take back as a feedback and, and um, help improve the services that we are providing to humanitarian organizations. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, ma'am and Sir Healy. Okay, so we have some more questions, but what we have to do at the Ha Center, we will do this and also compile all the questions and send them to our speakers. So we will publish the question and answer in the column. So it is our monthly publications of the Ha Center. Regine? 
Great. And in the meantime, Ilham, let's thank our speakers for their valuable time and the wealth of experience they've shared with us today. Friends, let's give it up for Ms. Amrita Hadlikar and Mr. Gilles Benoit Favier. A round of applause, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Much, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And finally, before we end this morning's session, Ilham, let's remind our participants a few other things. Yeah, uh, so for all and also for the participant, you can visit helix.ahacenter.org and do visit our virtual international exhibitions. Yes, of course. We also have one there, as I've mentioned a while ago, Move Her. If I try to promote um, use of electric tricycles as um, mobile community pantries to distribute food to far flung areas. And also, and also for those who registered for the focus session at 1030, you can find the link to your session in your email or by logging in at helix.ahacenter.org. Yes, and of course, also after lunch, we have the most exciting event in Helix, the iPitch. It's a competition for the most innovative idea. Everyone can vote for the most innovative idea. Just check your inbox for the link to join this afternoon's exciting session. Yes, and see you all again later. And let's give a round of applause to Regine. It's very good, a pleasure to co-host the Green Logistics Planner with you. So good day, everyone. Thank you. Round of applause also to Ilham, of course, and Aha Center. Thank you so much, everyone.